and I just click on it, probably just to bring it up. There we go. Okay. Looking warm. Okay. Good. Yeah, so it's there. Good. Okay. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for coming, and especially for the familiar faces in the audience bringing moral support, which is always really appreciated. Um, I'm excited to talk a little bit today about a project that uh, we've been working on uh, for the last couple of years. It's one of these labors of love that happens off of the corner of a desk. Uh, and uh, as, as a result, is, uh, requires a lot of team members to make it happen. Um, uh, it's on improving obesity management education and training for family medicine residents. Uh, so in terms of disclosures, um, this particular uh, project was supported um, with some funds from Alberta Innovates Health Solutions. Um, uh, and that's the rest of the, the uh, support I have there. The actual development of the pilot um, was uh, done without any commercial interest. Uh, we've been really grateful to Novo Nordisk, uh, who subsequently has gotten involved with regards to supporting um, a strategy for, for spreading uh, the message around changing the, the education climate for uh, obesity in preclinical and clinical education. And I'll talk a little bit about that in that effort at the end, because we're actively looking for people who want to be champions on that. Um, uh, and uh, the content of the course is actually on prevention and management, how to have effective conversations. It doesn't promote any particular strategy or therapy. Uh, I always say wicked problems take wicked teams, and so I just want to take a second to acknowledge the team because uh, they've all been tremendously um, energetic and helpful, particularly the students, actually, uh, who did the initial focus groups uh, with learners and with providers around what this should look like. So as we all know, uh, there's a big gap between the basic science around obesity um, and what's actually happening in clinical practice. And I know I can speak for myself. I'm a family doctor, and for the first 12 years of my practice, I really didn't know how to help patients living with this problem. Uh, I was really ineffective. It was really challenging. Uh, at the time, I didn't have an interdisciplinary team in clinic. Uh, and it was a lot of fumbling around, and yet we know that this is a pressing issue and concern. People come to us all the time with comorbidities and worries and concerns in the space. And so there's a real problem if the providers that they're coming to see uh, who take care of their other medical issues don't know how to help them. Uh, and there's a lot of press, of course, around the tsunami of obesity and the need, uh, you know, Globe and Mail headlines putting family doctors on the front line. But um, it's really hard if you're not actually receiving any training ever on how to actually be effective. So um, when we look at the literature, we can see you know this is not a problem just in Canada or just in Alberta. It's actually a problem all over. This was the lovely series in the Lancet a couple years ago where Dr. Dietz was, was pretty, pretty blunt about the challenge. Um, and it's not just, of course, in um, uh, family medicine that this is a challenge. It's a challenge throughout. So being practical type people, we're like, OK, I don't want to read another paper about the fact we don't know what we're doing. I know we don't know what we're doing. I know I didn't know what I was doing. I'm better now. Uh, we want to say, OK, well, what can you actually do to change that? All right, what are we going to do to actually do something different? You do the best you can until you know better, right? And so you, the uh, whole idea is to actually provide some training. So this was our objectives, was to increase awareness of the complexity of obesity and increase empathy in the, in the residents, medical residents, and to improve knowledge and self-efficacy in supporting patients with obesity prevention and management. So in Canada, um, Medicine is a uh, usually a post-grad course that happens for four years after an initial degree. And then family medicine residency is usually two to three years after that. So it's interesting, when we, uh, when we started this work and we asked the residents, the vast bulk of them did not feel at all prepared to be able to help the patients they were seeing every day with this problem. Um, so we, uh, we did it as a pilot in 2015 with our first year cohort in the urban program. So we had 60 residents rotating through the course, uh, and 42 of them consented to give data. So that's the data that we're going to present on here today. So the way we, uh, we actually did a bunch of focus groups with learners and stuff before when we were thinking about the course and thinking about what the content should be. And so the course actually has a couple of elements to it. And what we've done is we've, uh, on the Canadian Obesity Network webpage, on the 5 A's team project, at the top, we've got the whole course there. So the idea is to build resources and to share them so that others don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
Um, and what we're trying to do is get others to share their resources as well. <clears throat> but the course that we came up with had two parts. One was a knowledge part, so some lectures uh, around the basic pathophysiology of obesity, uh, about the 5 A's, approach to obesity management, about the tools and resources that have been created to help where the rubber hits the road within a primary care context, how to do this work within 15 minutes, um, how can we make this effective and efficient. Uh, and so there was lectures about it, but also practical elements. So there was standardized patients that we trained to be able to do encounters with the residents. So where the residents would be able to practice, you know, the asking permission to discuss it in the context of a patient coming in with a lot of other issues. Uh, a setting where they could actually then do a rapid assessment, 15 minutes, how to actually practice doing that in an efficient way. One with a mom coming in worried about her child. Uh, one child heavier, one child uh, slimmer, actually right out of my practice. Um, and the fourth case was a, uh, a obstetrics case, because of course family doctors in Canada do, do an awful lot of prenatal care. Um, <clears throat> so they practice, and then they go back to their continuity clinic, and their task is to find a patient and practice with a real patient. Uh, the other thing we did was we built in a bariatric suit experience where the residents would experience the encumbrance, the physical encumbrance, and go into the smart condo that we have and do some activities of daily living. And um, the intent of that was to help them reflect just even a tiny little bit on the quality of the advice that they give to patients. So I think for me, what really struck me when I did it was, you know, I'd often say build physical activity into your daily routine, you know, maybe take the stairs. And it wasn't until I actually put on the suit and realized how unsteady I felt. And I couldn't see my feet. And I was like, that's really bad advice to suggest to somebody that they do stairs, right? I'm sort of stumbling around on the flat. So just to have a little bit of a sense of reflection. And then these are the tools that are part of our bigger program of research. So the evaluation then, um, uh, we took a multi-method approach. Um, so in terms of quantitative measures, just pre-post for the course, uh, we looked at beliefs um, about ob obese person scale, the BAOP scale, the attitudes towards obese person scale, the ATOP scale, and then we did a pre-post question um, around their self-perceived level of confidence around different domains related to uh, weight management. In terms of qualitative, we had 73 narrative reflections that they had written about both the bariatric suit experience and their experience in clinic with practicing with patients that we analyzed. So the top is a picture of the smart condo and the second is uh, someone in a clinic. So in terms of quantitative results, um, what we were really reassured to see was all of the residents, the vast bulk of them, thought that obesity counseling was part of their job. What was a little bit more disheartening was Pretty much all of them didn't feel prepared to do it, right? Um, and they were all motivated to learn. So, so that was really positive. We did see changes um, on the a uh, BAOP questionnaire, so highly significant pre to post um, in terms of improvement. We didn't see improvement in the ATOP. And it was interesting because um, the scale, if you're familiar with it, goes from a minus three to a plus three. And what we observed when we looked at some people's um, scores as well as their narratives, they were really discordant. So some people who went down on their attitudes had really powerful narratives suggesting change. And so they were either creative writing or perhaps they got confused with the minus three. Um, so one of the things that came out of that is there's actually a new attitude scale that we're now using with the uh, subsequent versions of the course that we're continuing to do. Um, in terms of their self-perceived perceived increased confidence, they did perceive increased confidence around these different domains. So they felt more able to assess root causes, discuss options for treatment, work with people around their own personal goals, goals not being numbers on the scale, but goals being functional goals, helping them with assessing barriers and navigating, the, na navigating barriers. So that was, all, that was all positive. And I think it got cut off on the screen, but the obstetrics was also statistically significant. In terms of qualitative, there was four main themes that emerged. <clears throat> from the narratives, and the first was empathy so the, and, uh, and resistance. So the bariatric ex suit experience provoked a lot of strong emotion, uh, as was manifested in the narratives. So in those um, strong emotions, there was a lot of uh, language around just the physical experience and, and new recognitions and seeing themselves and in the mirror in the condo and things and having quite strong reactions to that. In a good portion of the residents, it provoked a lot of feelings of empathy and, and new ways of, uh, of understanding. In a subgroup of residents, it provoked resistance and sort of frustration that they would have to learn in that way. 
And that's something we've been sort of working on in subsequent iterations of the course, but it does tend to provoke strong response. In terms of the reflexivity, we saw that from both the uh, lecture content as well as the bariatric suit, that they had new ways of thinking about it. So they were thinking more about obesity as a chronic disease, more reflection on the quality of the advice that they were giving in clinic, <coughs> and, and a pretty universally uh, perception that this was part of their professional role and that this was something that they needed to know. Um, they really found the five A's approach that we were trying to teach them was really helpful in giving them some structure for the clinical consultation. So a place to start and a way to start to navigate it. So clearly uh, the degree of the course is not enough to really get true mastery, but that opportunity to practice and that opportunity to do that was actually perceived as being very helpful. Now one of the challenges that we have is that none of the preceptors feel comfortable, right? So when you go into continuity clinic and you have a preceptor who doesn't feel comfortable, we actually have to do work with the preceptors as well. And some of the preceptors are really open to it and some are not. Uh, so the students may get some pushback and, um, and some challenge with continuing to do this work in clinic. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do in that space. And so that would be part of the challenges, I think. And the other, um, the other thing that really comes out of that is that the students are all at a very different place. So even though they're all first year residents in family medicine, some of them are really dialed in and they're really engaged with this process of learning and they're ready to learn and some are not. And so even though we saw a lot of generally positive movement in terms of their, um, their experience and their shift, that shift was happening along a, a broad continuum and so that reinforces the need to, I think, do a lot of work in clinic to try to build up that opportunity for continued reinforcement. So that's pretty much where we're at. Um, where we're moving from here is we're trying to get together folks who are interested in this. Uh, we are allergic to the concept of reinventing the wheel. So we post everything on the site and we've got a group of folks from all over who are gonna be sharing things. So if any of you have roles in education and if you're interested in this space, uh, please speak to me because uh, what we wanna do is share and learn from everybody else's experience so that we can try to do this better. Thank you. Hence the coalition where we share materials. I was already talking to Helena and trying to suck her into the vortex. So yes, yeah, sounds fantastic. Completely agree, yeah. Okay, good, so catch up with you after. Thank you very much. Um, I'm presenting this on behalf of my uh, uh, co-authors, uh, Dr. Bluer from Germany, uh, Dr. Langell from um, um, Belgium, and and so on. So this is an, an uh, the uh, data are c collected from a multi-center uh, international study. Uh, here are my disclosures uh, that I can be rented but not bought. But the most important disclosure is that I'm an obesity and diabetes advocate hoping to see a world with fewer people affected by obesity and diabetes. Uh, the primary objective of uh, this post hoc analysis is really to look at uh, the three-year scale obesity and prediabetes data and to evaluate a proportion of individuals with prediabetes and obesity or overweight that were diagnosed with diabetes to identify if there are any uh, insights in terms of for those individuals who might have developed diabetes 
um, to find out what we can do, uh, perhaps after the fact, so to speak. Um, so we now look at the uh, baseline individuals to diagnose with diabetes. Now for those of you who didn't have a chance to uh, attend the luncheon symposium, uh, here's an outline of the, the clinical trial design. Uh, so the scale obesity and prediabetes trial was a three-year uh, study in individuals with prediabetes or overweight or obese. Uh, they were provided with life, uh, lifestyle intervention or health behavior changes consisting of a, a 500 calorie deficit diet along with 150 minutes of regular physical activity. Then they were randomized to either uh, placebo or liraglutide, uh, up titrated to three milligrams over a four week period. And they were followed for a three year uh, time frame, and the key endpoint is really to look at the time to onset for type 2 diabetes uh, at 160 weeks. And the diagnosis of prediabetes was based on one or three of the uh, following criteria. If they have fasting impaired uh, glucose or impaired fasting glucose, impaired uh, glucose tolerance, or an A1C between 5.7 uh, to 6.4 percent. Now, of course, there are individuals with one or more of these criteria. Um, so a total of uh, 2,254 eligible individuals with prediabetes were randomized to treatment with liraglutide, uh, 3 milligrams or placebo, and of those, uh, over 1,000 completed 160 weeks of treatment, 52% uh, in the liraglutide group and 45% in the placebo group. Uh, fewer people in the placebo group dropout is not surprising because, after all, it is an obesity trial, and people that were not uh, happy with the, uh, the weight loss uh, can obviously withdraw from the, uh, the study. So individuals that were diagnosed with diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, over a 160-week uh, treatment period were, on average, older, had more comorbidities, and had higher baseline A1C and fasting, uh, fasting plasma glucose, uh, and also a higher BMI. Uh, as shown uh, on the next slide here. Um, and again, uh, let me emphasize that they were quite balanced apart from the fact uh, that, uh, you know, those individuals who were diagnosed with diabetes uh, slightly older, uh, being 45 years of age, higher A1C values, and higher fasting uh, plasma glucose, and also uh, the two-hour post-glucose uh, OGTT showed higher numbers. Um, uh, the BMI values were also higher, uh, as well as um, you know, the obesity and comorbidities as well. Uh, so this is not a bit of a surprise. And a total of 3% of patients in the liraglutide group developed diabetes compared to 11% in the placebo group. Now, uh, for those of you who are at the present at the luncheon symposium, we're talking about a basically an 80% delay in the onset uh, of type 2 diabetes compared with placebo, and the time was about 2.7 times longer with liraglutide treatment. And the greatest risk for progression to type 2 diabetes was having a combination of one or more of the diagnostic criteria for prediabetes at screening. So now the next slide shows you the proportion of individuals that were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes placebo, but rather health behavior interventions in gray, health behavior interventions plus liraglutide in blue. You can see at the end of the 160 week, 46 individuals with health behavior alone developed diabetes versus 26. And uh, as you would uh, imagine, more and more people develop type 2 diabetes uh, uh, later on, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, so in total, 3% uh, of the individuals in the liraglutide group developed diabetes compared to 11%. Now, if you're looking at the proportion of individuals diagnosed with diabetes over time, coming off the medication and follow for another 12 weeks, you can see more individuals in the liraglutide group develop diabetes compared to the placebo group in the off-treatment period, demonstrating the fact that obesity is a chronic disease, therefore it requires a long-term solution, in which case pharmacotherapy is an integral component. And for those individuals with uh, type 2 di diabetes diagnosis at 160 weeks, this gives you the breakdown uh, as screening in terms of the prediabetes criteria. And as you can see, the majority of individuals 
uh, have actually more than one, uh, sorry, somehow I guess I can't, um, I'll, I'll probably have to use this one. Um, more individuals develop uh, diabetes if they have uh, all three criteria present. Now, in terms of uh, weight loss, uh, this is a busy slide, but one I want to highlight for you is, as one would expect, liraglutide treatment resulted in greater weight loss in the blue compared to health behavior interventions alone. And those individuals that develop diabetes are the circles, uh, open gray circles, are in the placebo or health behavior changes group only, and the solid blue individuals with uh, liraglutide treatment. Um, and, and it gives you an idea that the majority of individuals in the liraglutide treatment arm um, that, uh, that, that develop diabetes have actually very little weight loss. If anything, many of them actually gained weight. Uh, so this highlights for us that perhaps, um, you know, those are the individuals uh, that really did not respond as well to liraglutide treatment. So in terms of the safety overview, uh, liraglutide, uh, three milligrams, uh, was generally well tolerated and there were no new safety issues that were identified compared to the one-year study uh, that was published uh, in the New England Journal uh, two years earlier. Um, and by the way, the uh, three-year paper just came out in The Lancet uh, uh, two weeks ago. Um, and in individuals diagnosed with type 2 diabetes while on treatment, hypoglycemic events uh, were rare. Uh, but reported in one individual in the liraglutide three milligram treatment arm compared to three individuals uh, in the placebo group. Now, bearing in mind that these are individuals who did not have diabetes at the time, uh, so hypoglycemia was ascertained by actual measurement of the blood sugar, and we arbitrarily define hypoglycemia by a set value. Uh, none of the hypoglycemic episodes uh, were severe. Uh, so, in conclusion then, uh, treatment over three years with liraglutide three milligrams as adjunct to diet and exercise uh, greatly reduced the risk of type 2 diabetes compared with health behavior changes alone, and the hazard ratio was 80, or was 0.2, which means an 80% relative risk reduction in the onset of diabetes and delay of type 2 diabetes by as much as 2.7 times or 2.7 years. Uh, treatment with liraglutide 3 milligrams led to statistically significantly greater weight uh, loss compared with placebo. But for those individuals that were diagnosed with diabetes, they were on average older, had more comorbidities, had a higher baseline A1C, fasting glucose, and BMI than the entire randomized population and generally they lost less weight and some of them actually gained weight. And in general, liraglutide three milligrams uh, was uh, generally well tolerated. So thank you very much for your attention. First and foremost, I'm not so sure I would agree with uh, this concept of, of tolerance to Sasenda. Uh, so we've done a number of, 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 of follow-up studies uh, in, the, in these individuals. So those individuals that responded with 5% weight loss at 12 weeks continue to lose weight. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, that there were early responders. So the early responders who lost more than 5% body weight at 12 weeks uh, tend to do better and they continue to lose weight. But don't forget that what you're referring to, tolerance, is basically when they reach a maintenance phase, what happens is Sasenda or Liraglutide, three milligram, did not appear to be asso associated with greater weight loss. And that just kind of demonstrates that Liraglutide is still effective. So in other words, when you treat patients in the maintenance phase, you don't see the benefit until you take them off the drug. So when they come off liraglutide, then you see a rapid upshoot of the weight. And that's where it tells you that liraglutide is actually effective. So I hope I've answered your question uh, because th that often is a misperception. And that, in fact, is the reason why 
uh, many of the anti-obesity uh, drugs are stopped prematurely, either by patient or by the prescribing physician because of quote unquote lack of efficacy. But in fact, that is really not the case. And, and as I you know, mentioned earlier, if I have a patient that comes back to tell me, doctor, I'm very disappointed, I haven't lost any weight, and I say, congratulations, you haven't gained, which really means you have been successful in terms of curbing your weight. Yeah, I, sorry, I can't hear you. Do you mind speaking up? Well, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, 100% of my patients that I see in my practice do not want to go on medications. Uh, however, that said, you know, the alternative stuff on, you know, you know, in the pharmacy counters seems to be quite attractive, and they, they say, well, you know, there's no harm. You know, if it's a, a available in a pharmacy, it must be good so I can take it. But when it comes to prescription medications, they're extremely concerned because the first thing you think of it, it poisons me, it kills me, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of misperceptions, uh, so I spend a lot of time getting them to understand the issue. And the other thing is the majority of people that I see in my practice, like many of you, uh, they've already been through the yo-yo diets and they've been successful with weight loss, but then they don't understand that they actually have been quite responsive to whatever interventions. The problem is, they're dissatisfied, then they regress back to their usual habits, and that's when they regain the weight. And, and so, you know, I really emphasize to them that they have good response to whatever interventions, but the pharmacotherapy really helps them to sustain uh, the, the effort in terms of weight loss and weight maintenance. So now let's uh, uh, introduce the, the third presentation, uh, Laraglutide Adjunct Therapy Post-Bariatric Surgery, and uh, this will be presented by Renuka Modi. This one? Okay. Is it? Okay. This is it? This one? This one? Um, so I'm just going to get started here. Um, so I am uh, Renika Modi um, and Dr. Kazi is actually an endocrinologist at our clinic as well, who will be presenting the first half. Is this the presentation? No. <laughs> Somehow you can't read it. <coughs> and then you close this first. Pause you for I'm going to start a chant while we're waiting. Let's go, Oilers. <laughs> <laughs> who's from Edmonton? <laughs> and who's from Calgary? <laughs> Is anyone here from Ottawa? No? Okay. Let's go. Oh, we got it. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, our project evolved out of uh, considering using anti-obesity medications in our post-operative bariatric surgery patients. Uh, Dr. Modi and myself work in the Edmonton Adult Bariatric Clinic. Uh, our medical arm con contains uh, two family physicians, an endocrinologist, an internist, um, and of course Dr. Sharma, who you all know. Dr. Modi and I have received um, honoraria and speaker's fees from Nova Nordisk. Uh, however, this project was not funded and just developed by our team. 
Liraglutide is a GLP-1 receptor agonist, as many of you are aware, and uh, marketed under the brand name Saxenda, has been approved for chronic weight management. Um, it has 97% homology to our own endogenous GLP-1, which is secreted in the distal small intestine. And liraglutide has a two, sort of a two-fold mechanism of action where it works on appetite regulation as well as glucose regulation. And liraglutide works to lower body weight by decreasing caloric consumption, um, by increasing satiety and decreasing hunger. Liraglutide at, uh, marketed as Victoza is, has been approved for diabetes, whereas Saxenda at three milligrams is approved for chronic weight management. We started to wonder if there were patients in our, our, our bariatric surgery program who could benefit from liraglutide after surgery. Um, weight loss expectations with surgery may range from, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30 percent total body weight loss. And of course, this is going to vary depending on what surgery um, and what procedure they've had, as well as just individual patient variation. Um, so unfortunately, there's a number of patients after surgery who still, they do still struggle with weight issues. And these may be people who uh, lost weight initially and then suffer from weight regain, or perhaps people who haven't quite met their weight loss expectations. And we, we see people too who do really well after surgery, um, but because they've started at a high BMI, um, for instance, our average BMI in the clinic is about 50 kilogram per meter square. So they, they may do re really well with surgery um, but still want or are, are interested in further weight loss for things like a referral to a plastic surgeon. Um, so there was, looking at this slide here, there were three categories that we identified that perhaps they may um, benefit from liraglutide, and those are individuals, uh, perhaps they have suboptimal weight loss, not meeting 20% of their, 20% um, weight loss at one year, or if they've hit a weight plateau, so that their weight hasn't gone down um, by more than 5% over a three-month period, and then, of course, weight recidivism. So they've, they've lost weight and now have gained more than 10% of, um, of their lowest weight. And so these, these are not set definitions in the literature, um, really variable, and you know, different papers will describe um, these situations with different numbers, but this is what we have chosen um, for our project. Uh, we, we, our pilot project, I suppose, was looking at just retrospective, prospective chart review of our patients on Lyra up to three milligrams and looking at a primary outcome of body weight change once we initiate liraglutide and have them on this medication for 16 weeks and then 24 weeks, so looking at their weight change and BMI change. Secondary outcomes we wanted to try to describe the side effect profile that these patients were having with liraglutide and if anyone needed to stop the medication uh, due to these side effects. And one question we weren't sure, you know, were patients going to have greater side effects because they were um, in the post-op setting? Uh, we wanted to try to answer that as well. So from here, I'll let Dr. Modi uh, take over, starting with our inclusion criteria into the study. All right, so here are our inclusion criteria. So we included adult patients um, who had had a previous primary bariatric procedure, um, which included either a gastric bypass, a sleeve gastrectomy, an adjustable gastric band, as well as patients who had previously had VBG, okay? They had to qualify for weight loss medication, so we incl included patients who had a BMI of at least 30, <coughs> okay, they had to have had a suboptimal weight loss outcome, be experiencing a weight plateau, or more commonly, weight recidivism or weight regain. Um, of course, they had to be interested in further weight loss treatment, and informed consent was obtained from all of these patients included in the data set. All right. So patients were excluded if they had any contraindication to taking a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, so the contraindications are a personal or family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma, uh, personal history of men type 2, 
And we always made sure our female patients of reproductive age are on birth control. Of course, they were excluded if they were already on a GLP-1 agonist, which was typically for diabetes management. Um, patients were excluded if they were having ongoing post-op complications um, and investigation. So classically, these patients were referred to uh, myself because I work with the revision clinic. Um, and you know, they'd had a previous primary bariatric procedure having issues with usually weight regain. Um, but their surgeon there would fully work them up. They would have a swallow study. Um, they would have a gastroscopy usually. And that was to make sure anatomically nothing was wrong, okay? If they did not qualify for revisional bariatric surgery, which is four out of five patients in that clinic, so four out of five patients do not get revision surgery, so they're left with nothing. So then they'd be referred to me for medical management for their weight recidivism. Um, uh, uh, other patients, so certain patients were excluded if they had reversal of their primary bariatric procedure. So typically this would involve removal of their gastric band. You can't reverse a sleep and technically you shouldn't reverse the bypass. Um, if they were lost to follow up um, and then some patients were um, not able to tolerate Saxenda. Um, so if they discontinued treatment, they were excluded. Um, but all of this was documented and um, tracked. All right, so the mean age of patients included in the study thus far uh, was 51. All patients referred were female, which is interesting. Um, the mean weight when liraglutide was started was 120.9 kilograms, corresponding to a BMI of 44.6. Now, currently, we've only collected data on nine patients, so these results are very preliminary. But right now, I believe we have nearly 30 patients now enrolled in this pilot project, and we plan to conclude once we have six months of data on 25 patients, okay? So of those nine patients, one was a gastric bypass patient, four were sleeve gastrectomy patients, two had BBGs a long time ago, and two had lap bands. All right. So um, weight, mean weight loss at three months, okay, was 9.6 kilograms corresponding to a mean percentage change in body weight of 8.3 percent. At six months, mean weight loss was 16 kilograms corresponding to a mean percentage change in body weight of 13.1 percent, okay? So just as a comparison, in scale pre-diabetes, which Dr. Lau talked about, um, mean percentage change in body weight at one year, so not three months, not six months, at one year in patients who were completers on liraglutide, so they completed one year of treatment, was 9.2%. So these results were surprisingly encouraging to us. All right, so to date, we have data, uh, three month data on nine patients, and we have six month data on four patients. Um, and again, um, the, the mean reduction in BMI was 3.6 points at three months, at six months, 6.1 kilograms per meter square. I will come back to this slide in a second. Um, so GI side effects were not uncommon. Um, so things like nausea, very infrequent vomiting, heartburn, um, diarrhea, and the initial titration, period, and then long-term constipation and taste dysgeusia, where food, you know, you feel like your taste buds are altered, I guess. Um, you know, so the side effects were similar to those observed in scale prediabetes. So in this post-op bariatric surgery patient cohort, I was worried. Like, I was worried. Like, they had bands, they had, you know, a narrowed stomach, like a sleeve. I actually thought they would have more nausea. I thought they would have significant reflux. I was quite concerned about GI side effects. But you know what? We didn't see any difference. They were, it was similar to our non-surgical patients who were on Sexenda. 
The side effects were mild in severity, and they were transient in nature, just like seen in the SCALE trials. Now, so far, one patient has discontinued liraglutide. Um, she has significant nausea, heartburn, stomach upset, um, but she's actually returned to follow-up regularly, and she's interested in retrialing the medication, but at a much lower dose, and she'd like to titrate up uh, more slowly. So now I'm going to go back. So before we end, I'd just like to take a minute to show the weight changes for patient ML, um, who was the Ruan-Y gastric bypass patient for whom we have six months data on. Um, so patient ML um, actually had her gastric bypass with one of our surgeons through our clinic. Um, at her initial assessment, she weighed 162 kilograms, corresponding to a BMI of 64, okay? She did well with lifestyle changes, and pre-op, she weighed 143.5 kilograms, and then her lowest weight post-op was 106.3 kilograms, corresponding to a BMI 42. So she went from a BMI of 64 to 42. That's 22 BMI points, so that's excellent, right? But at this point, she returned to clinic. She's a Manitoba patient, and she made the trip back, and she was adamant and really interested in further weight loss for a common reason. She wanted skin removal surgery. She wanted a breast lift, her arms, her legs, and the paniculectomy. And to see plastics, specifically, you need a BMI of 35, okay? So she had reset her goal. So she saw her surgeon again in our clinic, and our surgeon wasn't sure what to do, so he consulted with the rest of the surgeons. And they did briefly consider revising her bypass to a long limb bypass, which we don't typically do. So ultimately, they decided against it, and she was referred to me. Unfortunately, by the time I saw her, she had experienced weight recidivism. So this is actually a 10%, it's exactly 10% weight regain. She was very interested in trialing Saxenda, and of course her biggest barrier was cost, okay? Um, so she trialed the Saxenda, she paid out of pocket, and fortunately she did very well. She has now surpassed her lowest post-op weight with adjunct liraglutide. She maintains about a 1,200 kilocal diet. Um, she meets protein requirements, she adheres to post-op dietary recommendations, and at this last weigh-in, which was in January, so she comes kind of every few months, uh, this is a BMI of 37. So the whole point is, I think this slide clearly depicts obesity as a chronic disease. It's a spectrum, right? Um, and that, um, you know, there's weight regain and that there's need for ongoing management, right? Even in the post-op period, you know, we always think about behavior modifications. Now we have uh, an anti-obesity medication that is not only for the non-surgical patient or the pre-op bariatric surgery patient, but it now has this evolving role in the post-op bariatric surgery patient, okay? So just to conclude, uh, high-dose Lyra shows promise as a well-tolerated and effective option for further weight loss in patients post-bariatric surgery. Any questions?
diet. She did uh, layer glutide here. For the, we had to get her weight down to get her on the table, right? Um, and then with Lyra, I re right after the sleep, she kind of wasn't eating much here. And we wanted her to keep losing weight so we could get her to a bypass. So now with Lyra, she's been trending down really nicely. And now she's back on off the fast getting ready for a bypass. She really responded to Lyra. So she started it, I think, four months after her sleep. Yeah. One short question. On the patient I saw that was severe nausea, what sort of procedure did she have? She had a bypass. person's not in our data set. We, so we have 30 patients now, so she's not part of this initial data set. She's a more recent patient we've added to the study, so she's not part of these nine patients. Yeah. She was a bypass as well. And then Mary Wall was a bypass as well. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks for this opportunity to present at the summit. This is actually my first time here. And I want to flag for people that I come at this work as a physical therapist, though I haven't worked clinically for a long time. And I'm a PhD sociologist. And I flag that for you simply because sociologists in health services audiences are sort of known for saying uncomfortable things. <laughs> it's sort of our job in this world. So, so if I say something controversial, unsettling, or you're sort of interested in why I choose to phrase things the way I do, let's, let's talk, okay? And certainly we can talk outside of the Q&A, Q I'm here. So I'm here to unpack how two prominent knowledge brokers in Canada have recommended primary care clinicians care for people with obesity. And by knowledge brokers, I'm talking about people who take knowledge from various places, they reassemble them into some sort of a new package that they think is going to help their target audience. It's an active process of brokering of knowledge. And so the two knowledge brokers in uh, question are pretty familiar to people. The Canadian Task Force on Preventative Healthcare, who published their Canadian guideline um, for obesity in adults in 2015 in the CMAJ. And the second being the Canadian Obesity Network. Are we not having slides? Oh, can we pause? Because the slides are actually critical. showing up on here. So it must be. Oh, there it is. Perfect. We got it. Yeah, okay. that was, yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. And the second one will be very obvious uh, to people in the room. This is the Canadian Obesity Network's Five A's um, of Obesity Management, published. I'm using the original one, published in 2012. And and my PhD. This comes out of my PhD work, where I was in clinics as an ethnographer, watching how clinicians talked with with patients about eating, exercise, and weight. And that's where the five A's came to my attention. And I've sort of been continuing to look at all the people who are trying to change care since that time. So 
when I think of something having an evidence base, I'm a physical therapist, I think of a base of support. I ask myself, how solid is that evidence base? How, how wide is it? How broad is it? How much room do they have to move? Or, or is there sort of a risk of a fall? And so I want to highlight how these two knowledge brokers build from different evidence bases. They make decisions about what to include, and that means they promote different ways to intervene in people's lives, right? And those differences have real-world implications if we're recognizing that stigmatization happens in clinical practice. And these are just some examples of different ways by which it can happen. But that's what's at stake here. Getting this wrong can actually not intervene in these kinds of clinical processes. So it, knowledge brokering really matters. Now, I'm, I'm talking about these as I'm comparing them as procedural standards, also a bit of sociology jargon. Um, procedural standards are simply those standards that attempt to coordinate or encourage or even require that people take certain actions in the world. So, oh. so um, I compare these two as both being procedural standards in that sense. And of course, different standards have different levels of legal force. We're not talking about that in this case. We're talking about standards that, procedural standards that exist, they're circulating in Canada, and different clinicians may be choosing to use them or not. So, I'm studying really how, um, how these knowledge brokers, what they've included in their standards. What do they define as the problem? What do they treat as changeable or what is not changeable at all? What actions do they encourage? And, and particularly, how do those fit against what we know about stigmatization? Um, and on what justification basis, right? What's that knowledge foundation and what's ignored or left out? So let's start with the Canadian Task Force. And the image you're about to see is a direct copy of the text box that's in the CMAJ article. This is if you only flip into the article to see what is the standard, this is what you see. This is also what the only thing you see if you go to their website and pull up the standard. So the text that I'm showing you is that like central piece that's repeated. Now I'd add that there's always a lot of writing around it that adds nuance and justification, et cetera, but, but their performance indicators very much align with what they've recommended clinicians do here. So they recommend people calculate BMI. The text adds some nuance. They recognize that BMI is imperfect, um, but given it's the one primarily used in, intervention, in uh, weight loss intervention studies, we're essentially stuck with it. It's part of the justification. It's also that you know we know that there are some problems with this classification system, potentially how it would affect different people from different ethnic groups. Um, but you know it's still the one the WHO and other international groups use, so we're sort of stuck with it. That's kind of what the text says. Then in terms of treatment, they, um, they, they have a pharmacological, they considered it, and they at that point in 2015 did not recommend that. Um, they considered whether you should be doing anything to prevent weight gain with people uh, who are classified as having normal weight. No, nope, the answer is no. There's nothing to support you in the evidence to say that. But for those with um, a BMI of 25 to 39.9, it's recommended that they have structured behavioral interventions. And in the quote, in the sort of subtext below the footnote, it's that we're talking about behavioral modification programs that involve several sessions or interactions that take place over weeks to months. So that will be very familiar to people. I will say, from coming from more of a critical weight studies and a fat studies background, behavioral modification programs sound very odd to people from that community. But it's very clear here. It's very clear cut what they're saying. If BMI is between 25 and 39.9, behavioral modification is recommended. And I'd flag for you that at no point in the text do they suggest the possibility that someone could have a higher BMI, a BMI in this range, and have impeccable health behaviors. So how do they know that this is a good uh, recommendation to make? They, they say this is a, a function of the, the benefits, uh, an evaluation of benefits and harms. How do they identify benefits and harms? Well, they look at RCTs in particular. And I don't want to go into the details here, but I want to flag for you that it's essentially about short-term weight loss on average. For the small number of studies that have looked at long-term, you're talking about weight regain, there's an assumption that there's no um, risks that go along with those types of programs. They didn't look for harms with assessment, so they just assume that measuring people's weight uh, is a, is a non-issue. 
Um, and if we're talking about people with histories of eating disorders, we know that that's not necessarily the case, and that's not always known to clinicians. Um, and as for patients' values and preferences, they say that they're understudied. But here we see that what they were look, they didn't look to the stigma literature to say, are these types of actions ones that patients have certain perspectives on? So what they were looking for were studies of um, people who had done these kinds of interventions, gone to the structured behavioral program. So and I want to flag one more choice that the task force made. I'll just let you read this. So essentially, they made the decision to remove a whole body of literature in terms of how to, how to suggest primary care clinicians work with people with obesity. This is what they sort of have said this is the most important thing about in terms of the decision support tool that the Canadian Task Force is going to provide to clinicians. And if we look at, in comparison to the Canadian Obesity Network, 5As, we'll see it's not the only body of knowledge they've chosen to, to not include, and I know this is going to be very familiar to people, I will go quickly, but so essentially we also see assess and treat, right, but f we see ask, that's there before, um, and it speaks to a whole other body of knowledge, again, that's being included in Canadian Obesity Network. Why is it that you would need to ask permission before you actually open this conversation? If we start to look at assessment, assessment is of the body. Yes, BMI is there. It's a measure. It's marked as a measure of mass, of, of mass, but not health. But other bodies of knowledge are coming in here. What else might you need to assess to know this person's body well? And the things that you might need to know about their, their comorbid conditions as well as what's going on in their lives, right? So if somebody is gaining weight and is currently um, delivering palliative care to their dying spouse, is now the time to offer or refer to a structured behavioral program. So th the expectation is that that is in your mind before you begin to think about what treatment you might consider. They, in their assessment of root causes, we see here again the possibility of obesity not being something related to activity necessarily. We're disrupting that stigmatizing story that people who are larger inherently have not, do not have good health behaviors. And here we see essentially a multiplicity being made. Uh, the obesity becomes obesities. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the treatment. Uh, I can't do that in the time we have here, nor, nor do I need to. But this is the big flag that, that is really, key, really critically different, is that the success of treatment is, is measured in improvements in health and well-being. Right? So this is like we're seeing very clear differences in terms of decisions that these knowledge brokers make about how p primary care clinicians should intervene in people's lives. So we see here, and this is just a beginning, right, that there are so many different types of knowledge being include, included in this evidence base. And as a result, they're authorizing very different ways of intervening in people's lives, right? The Canadian Task Force, although there's other considerations kind of listed as to why people may not be interested in following through with the recommendation, but they, they continue, nowhere in the text do they disrupt the notion that behaviors might need to be assessed before you would know what to treat. And if we go back to those stigmatizing clinical conditions, the assumption that BMI tells the truth about people's behaviors is a known stigmatizing action to take in the clinic, right? And compared to the Canadian Obesity Network, this this, who actively refuses this way of pushing and pulling lives. So one thing to think about, sorry, I might be. One thing to think about here is the possibility that the Canadian Task Force is, is sort of caught up in its own set of standardizations. It has very standardized processes by which it brokers knowledge, and it has a very standardized um, way of uh, RCTs, the main source of information they follow, are also themselves very standardized in what they think of um, and how they study things like people's responses to the treatment. So it could be that the Canadian Task Force is just caught up in a set of standardizations that themselves are, are making it difficult for them to, to do this work. And it, but it's also possible that if they'd considered a different choice about the outcome to pursue, that they would not have been here because they chose weight loss as the outcome that was most important. Everything sort of orients to weight loss. 
So I w you know, the, eth the, the um, effects of this aren't known without ethnographic study. We don't really know how to the extent to which clinicians take up these standards, practice them. Um, but, but the present study help makes explicit that we're living in this um, time where there's an active controversy of what, what it means to deliver good obesity management in the clinic. And, and I think that reflects also dec decades old debates about what comprises good care, right? How scientific knowledge should be used, how much it should be foregrounded and drive the outcomes that you seek with your patients. So I'll leave it there, thank you. And please know I'm just here for the whole conference. So if I've ma said anything, wow, um, let's, let's take some time to talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Um, I understand, and I wasn't here earlier, but David had a chance to go through the um, data. I understand David had a chance to go through the data of the scale uh, obesity and pre-diabetes, 56 weeks. So I'll really just be building on what is the three-year extension of that clinical trial. Which one was yours? I don't see yours. Hmm? Are you, have you loaded yours? Um, I assume that that... Uh, no, it hasn't been loaded yet. Mm -hmm. Do you have your stick? No. <laughs> oh dear. No, I don't think he has the presentation here. Maybe what we should do yeah, is to yeah. switch to the, um, so the, perhaps just to make up for time, there's a bit of a, a program change. So why don't we move on to the next uh, presentation? So do they have it? Yes. We have here on a stick we can use. So do you, where's the program, where's it? Um, he's just bringing it on the stick now. Okay, so why don't we present from the stick? Mm -hmm. Great. 
No, it's not. Sir, can the AV person come by here? Because again, I, I don't think we can see it on the computer, but it's not on the screen. It's not doing anything. So you must have kicked it. Did it come off? I'm not showing it on the screen. No, I've got it there. Gross. Nathan Shea came up here and said this connection is strictly with this. It was working before. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, okay, all of a sudden. Was <laughs> that you? Just do this. Ah, perfect. Okay, so sorry for the delay. Um, I am David Macklin. I'll be, I'll be presenting the three-year data, three-year part of the scale obesity and prediabetes trial. Um, uh, <laughs> these are not my disclosures. I uh, disclose that I have uh, honorarium received from Novo Nordisk. I have also consulting fees from Novo Nordisk and no other disclosures. Uh, one other, I run a, 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 a partially private hybrid behavioral weight management program in Toronto. So we'll be talking about the prediabetes arm of the obesity and prediabetes trial. David was here earlier speaking about this large clinical trial, the first 56 weeks, which described the answer to the question of can liraglutide as an adjunct to a lifestyle program, can it as an adjunct to that provide safety and efficacy in the outcome of weight loss. He demonstrated also that other outcomes were found between Lyra 3.0 and placebo, which included improvements in glycemic parameters, a lack of progression to uh, type 2 diabetes in the prediabetes individuals, improvements in cardiovascular risk factors, improvements in weight. What I'll be discussing today is the extension of this program, which is the three-year data. When this when the population was, the subjects were first randomized, they were randomized in a two to one ratio, and it was found that approximately half of these patients were pre-diabetic. And so this is the progression of the underlying arm, where now we have at a two to one randomization, subjects who are being followed for the entire three years, and we have the comparison between liraglutide and placebo. Both arms receiving lifestyle interventions, and the primary outcome that we're looking for, the primary question is, can the raglatide at 3.0 in conjunction with lifestyle, can this uh, achieve a reduction at the three-year point in the incidence of diabetes? It's a great question that's been asked even going as far back as the diabetes prevention program, where there a lifestyle question was, can a lifestyle program, as opposed to standard behavioral treatment, can a lifestyle program prevent the onset of diabetes in a pre-diabetic population? Here you'll see that we're talking about a sample uh, of patients that are, uh, include exclusion criteria of type 1 or type 2 diabetes, being on medications that can affect weight were excluded, having uh, depression, uh, having a history of MEN2 or family history or also excluded patients with, uh, with uh, the rare form of thyroid cancer as well. And in this intervention, the inclusion criteria, you can see, excuse me for one moment, 
The inclusion criteria were the standard inclusion criteria of a BMI of 27 or more if they have comorbidities and a BMI uh, of 30 and above. Looking at the characteristics of these patients, we see here in the group some interesting data. If we look at the, first off, uh, primarily females, 75%, and you can see that the diagnostic criteria for prediabetes are the American Diabetes Association numbers. In fact, I think we see this here at the top of the slide, hemoglobin A1C range, fasting blood sugar range, and two-hour OGTT range. And by the way, uh, a stringent criteria which collected more pre-diabetics than the diabetes prevention program, which in fact um, allowed people to have all the categories uh, qualified, where here any one of them meant that we we're diagnosing them with prediabetes, a little bit of a larger population. Here we see the, uh, the numbers, again, relatively conservative. These are patients that my, myself as a family doctor, you know, recognize fasting blood sugars on average of 5.5, the OGTT of 7.4, really borderline. Um, you see the weight in BMI categories, somewhere around 38, 39 in BMI. You see that there's a real nice representation of these three groups of uh, obesity, though the speaker earlier spoke very well of how there are limitations to the body mass index measure. Here we have a broad spectrum from both class one, class two, and class three. The secondary outcome of this clinical trial is mean weight loss. And so looking at this change in body weight by percentage at the end of 160 weeks, we see first that first year data. You can notice the first year data, which I'm sure David reviewed, the difference between 3.5 and 9.2 between placebo and the Lyra 3.0 group. But now, again, these are all the pre-diabetic patients taken forward three years. And we see at the end of the three years, a delta, a difference between uh, weight loss, first the non-last observation carried forward data, which shows 7.1 as the treatment mean weight loss and 2.7 for the placebo. And the concept of placebo subtracted weight loss, if this wasn't mentioned earlier, is because this is really one of the qualifications for a medication when they're getting FDA uh, approval, that there be this 5% placebo subtracted weight loss at one or two years. So here, just to uh, note, we're looking at a difference of approximately that, but we're looking at three-year data. And the last observation carried forward means quite simply that if the patient was lost to follow-up, the last data point that was collected is then simply used and extrapolated forward. There's this very interesting continuation of the study that is when treatment ends, so the end of treatment but continuation of study for another 12 weeks shows this compelling picture of both in placebo but also in the uh, Lyra 3.0 arm, you see a rise in weight. David had earlier today s suggested one of the signals there is that it's a reminder that this is a chronic disease and if any other chronic disease, if someone's on high blood pressure medication, no one is surprised if they come off their medications and their blood pressure goes up. There was a, uh, also a secondary outcome within this clinical trial of categorical weight loss. And why these will be often in weight management trials is because categorical weight loss is the other mechanism that the FDA will use to approve weight loss medications. They'll say that we'll want to see at one or two years a uh, starting with the 5% column, they'll want to see in the treatment group at least 35% of them achieving 5% or greater of, uh, mean, uh, of mean weight loss. And so here you see certainly even at the three-year point, still uh, a, a medication compared to placebo that is offering above the 35% that is the cutoff for a medication for FDA approval. Greater than 5%, uh, next column greater than 10%, uh, you see again a substantial or significant difference, and again at 15%, not the 
subject of today's talk, but there is a very, very interesting concept that's really near and dear to my heart that talks about early responders versus early non-responders. And looking at the groups, and one of the last talks, too, really interestingly described how we see a response to liraglutide in that patient that was uh, post-sleeve uh, surgery, which was, to me, very interesting. Um, here, a data point from the three-year study that shows that within the year, uh, rather within the three years, there is a regression, again, not the primary outcome. It was incidence of diabetes, primary outcome. But here we're looking at another outcome, which is regression to normal glycemia. So here we show that 66% uh, of those with prediabetes receiving the lira, uh, in the lira arm, uh, found uh, a regression to normal glycemia. And that, that was significantly different than the placebo regression to normal glycemia in this pre-diabetic population, which was only 36%. Again, I love this 12 weeks after the, the medication ends, but 12 weeks followed. Again, we see a uh, drop in those who had regressed to normal glycemia. Clearly, there's two issues here when we talk about effects on glycemic parameters in these patients. There's weight loss, and there's the glycemic effect of the medication itself. And so really hard to tease out in this study as opposed to Zendos, for example, which David presented earlier today, which is really, uh, you know, if anything, affecting maybe lipids, but certainly not no direct glycemic effect. So hard to tease out the effects between uh, the medication and the weight loss. Um, the primary endpoint, based on these Kaplan-Meier plots, we see that um, uh, three percent of participants in the liraglutide group versus 11 percent in the placebo group were diagnosed with diabetes. Again, the primary outcome at 160 uh, weeks. Uh, with continued treatment over 160 weeks, uh, the second uh, key point in the primary outcome of this study is that they estimated that the onset of type 2 diabetes was 2.7 times longer. Progression to diabetes was delayed 2.7 times. Uh, and this uh, was uh, corresponded to a hazard ratio of 0.2. The secondary outcome list within this clinical trial, really near and dear to family physicians and to uh, physicians who are treating these patients. So we see significant improvements in treatment versus placebo in waist circumference, significant differences in systolic blood pressure, and um, and less than significant changes in diastolic blood pressure. Uh, cardio other cardiovascular risk factors, uh, really across the board, significant changes, um, uh, including this list uh, of inflammation markers. As far as adverse events, I'm sure everyone's familiar with this diagram, but here you see um, with the blue dots being lira and the clear dots being placebo, you see where are the separations in these uh, adverse events. And we see uh, expectedly around gastrointestinal side effects, most notably nausea, nasopharyngitis, diarrhea, constipation, and vomiting. Though it has been mentioned also that if you create and follow even a, a, a slow dose escalation process, many of these side effects can be uh, avoided. Uh, adverse uh, events of special interest, well, um, this story is truly incomplete. Certainly we see gallbladder-related events that are higher in the center column here than those with placebo in the treatment arm higher. We know that certainly weight loss is associated with gallbladder-related uh, events, but then we also know with GLP-1 and a GLP-1 analog that it does have central effects on the gallbladder, can reduce, uh, sorry, increase the or slow down the emptying as it does on the stomach. I think that's still a question that's outstanding and this needs to be watched with patients who are on Lyra. And we see uh, also uh, a slight increase in acute pancreatitis events relative to, uh, relative to placebo. And again, the question of whether gallbladder uh, events might also have an association with that and that this might be a weight loss effect or also obviously GLP-1 receptors 
on the pancreas, could this be a direct class effect as well? The MACE events we know were equal between the two groups. Um, total withdrawals, just a take home message here, at the end of one year, only 75% of people were still within the clinical trial, and about at the end of three years, only about 50%. That's real standard for these types of trials. In conclusion, individuals with prediabetes who uh, had overweight or obesity, after three years of treatment with Lyra 3.0 as an adjunct to diet and exercise, this was associated with a lower risk of type 2 diabetes. Three years of treatment was associated with weight loss, improvements in cardiometabolic risk factors, which if sustained in the long term may be associated with, with reduced CV risk. Uh, and no safety issues uh, were identified as compared to the initial 56-week period of the trial. Thank you for your attention and any questions? Just a sec. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I've got my disclosure slides here. I've never pr uh, filled these out before in Australia, so I'm not sure I've done them correctly, but I, I gave it my best shot. I don't have any uh, personal uh, conflicts of interest, um, but this research was supported by a grant from my College of General Practitioners, as well as the Australian Primary Healthcare Research Institute. And the university that I work for, um, the Australian National University, uh, wrote the program that I'm going to be discussing. Let's move through those. So I'm here representing a large group of people. Um, we are GPs as well as allied health professionals um, and methodologists as well as um, stakeholder groups such as um, Diabetes Australia and the Heart Foundation. And those were the two grants I spoke about. So Australia, um, this is Australia of course, this is where I'm from to remind Denise who um, only learnt recently where Canberra was from, was. Um, and I, I live in a really beautiful place with gorgeous places to walk and beautiful bushland. This is just five minutes from my house. So in Australia, we have a very big problem with obesity, uh, bigger than in Canada. Uh, we have rates of obesity at about 30%. And if we look at overweight and obesity, it's up at around 60%. So this uh, program I'm gonna to talk to you about came from a clinical problem that I, we had as general practitioners within practice. We were having people coming to see us for help with their weight, they were wanting the help, um, but we didn't have anything to offer them within the practice itself. Um, at home, our gold standard is to refer to dietitians uh, for treatment, um, but in, in Australia it's very rare to have uh, GPs working with allied health in the same building, that's quite unusual. Um, so patients were finding it difficult in terms of time pressures and seeing different health professionals. Cost, allied health is not funded in the same way as general practice care. Um, in our rural regions in particular, they've just no allied health uh, professionals available. Uh, we have an obesity management unit in the city where I work, but the waiting list is well over 12 months and they're yet to perform the first publicly funded uh, bariatric procedure. And some patients would prefer to work with their GP on their weight and we have that in the Australian literature. So from uh, the primary care literature, um, there is um, more uh, recognition of primary care providers as having a key uh, role in the management of obesity. But when we look at GPs, and this is from uh, the initial pilot work, uh, we did, serve, uh, did qualitative interviews with the GPs involved in this project, and they were all saying these kind of things about working with people with obesity. And that is pretty much consistent um, in the Canadian literature as well. 
I'd like to just briefly touch on uh, Bandura's theory, um, social cognitive theory, which looks at self-efficacy. So people feeling like they have the ability to achieve certain outcomes or the self-efficacy. And we know from Bandura's theory that the doing of things is going to lead to much longer uh, change in people's behaviour and their learning. Just keep that in the back of our mind as we listen. So we developed a program called the Change Program. Um, it's basically a structured uh, program for GPs to work with their patients. We have a patient handbook, uh, which is a self-management toolkit, takes people through um, both worksheets and uh, educational uh, fact sheets. And the idea is they come back and forward from their GP um, and talk about what they've worked on at home. Um, we've followed Australian best practice guidelines to develop the program. We suggested that people saw their GP about once every two weeks uh, for the first three months and then uh, less frequently as time progressed. So we did a feasibility trial and we had five general practices, four from the city where, I'm, where I live and one rural practice. There are at least two GPs in each practice that were part of the trial and each GP was asked to recruit at least two patients. So we used mixed methods to look at uh, the outcomes of the trial. Today I'm going to really focus on the outcomes of the GPs and how they felt that the process went. So in terms of the patients, we had 23 patients. At three months we'd had three withdrawals and at the six month, uh, which was the end point of the feasibility study, um, we had feedback from 20 patients. In terms of the GPs, the GPs were very experienced, up to 30 years in clinical practice. So after the uh, six month trial, we did further qualitative work with the GPs and their, their conversations around obesity had changed. They were talking about feeling more confident. They were talking about uh, really liking the structured approach. They said previously, they kind of ran out of things to talk about or ideas to, to run with, but in, with having the toolkit to work alongside them, they felt more confident to talk with their patients. We also did a quantitative uh, survey pre and post uh, the feasibility trial. And these, the questions in the, the survey were based around the five A's. Interestingly, the assess and advise, uh, which we, we say ask, we say assess, so they're slightly different A's at home. Um, they were already reasonably confident pre-trial for that. Uh, but post-trial, the assist and arrange had um, improved confidence. And it's quite important because we know uh, that the assist and arrange part of the five A's is the one that most clinicians struggle with. So just picking out a couple of those quantitative measures, uh, a feeling of confidence to empower the patient to change. We've used um, like it stack distribution graphs to show um, the difference and the black is the median for this group. They felt more uh, empowered to tailor plans to individual patients and they felt that their barriers to change, so working through the patient with the obstacles that were in the way was also improved. The other interesting thing that came out of the qualitative work was that the GPs really uh, were seeing a change in their practice across the whole board. So they found that even in patients who weren't in the trial, they were starting to pick up skills that they'd learnt using the pilot with just the two patients and using it in other patients. So we really saw this ripple effect through the GP's practice. So if we go back to Bandura's social cognitive theory and looking at what uh, had happened for the patients in this trial, they'd really had a performance mastery experience. They'd had a go at something, had seen it work, and it really improved their confidence around uh, obesity uh, management. So in terms of building a professional self-efficacy for GPs, we've, we really saw the pay, uh, this program provide a structured approach for the GPs and it really uh, highlights the fact we need more than just didactic educational approaches for uh, GPs and family doctors. We need to be supporting them to do things and seeing good outcomes. So where to from here? We're looking at doing a step wedge uh, cluster randomised trial at home uh, to look at the effectiveness of the change program um, and I'm happy to take any questions.
Yes, we did measure the clinical outcomes. Um, today's presentation is on the GP, but I'm happy to. Um, so, in, were you more interested in weight or which? which we, yeah, so the main ones we did were weight. Um, we saw a 3.2% drop across the whole cohort, so even the people that dropped out. It was a big uh, a range though, so a handful of people lost 10% of their body weight through to a couple of people gaining weight. Um, we used a binge eating scale, the impact of quality of life, impact of weight and quality of life scale, uh, a physical activity um, marker as well, and a Wonka uh, functional measure of um, health. Um, and we saw a trend towards improvement in all of those. Um, we didn't have enough patients to look at things like um, blood pressure and waist circumference. We did take them all, but it's a small group of people. Oh, sorry. This sure. No. So in Australia, we have no uh, weight management uh, drugs funded under our health system. The ones that are available are available privately, uh, but there's very low uptake of medications in Australia. Thank you, David. And I'll try to get the presentation there. So I have the slides here, but they're not showing. This is crazy. So maybe while we, yeah, I can maybe start while uh, they're, you, can you check if they're trying to solve the problem? <laughs> okay, so it's a pleasure on behalf of uh, my co-investigator to present uh, our work. Um, and now I would be showing you acknowledgements to start the different people, in fact, we've got more than 30 people involved in this project, uh, a program development committee who helped uh, uh, gathering the data from uh, the evidence, but also for, from our pre-implementation evaluations in order to develop the integrated program, an evaluations committee, implementation committee too. Thank you. 